The talk I'm about to give you uh, is uh, remarkably similar to a talk I gave 20 years ago at Intel in Santa Clara. They had a yearly meeting back then where they, maybe they still do it, where they bring in senior managers from around the, the company and around the world, uh, several hundred people for a couple of days of discussions. And part of that meeting, they had uh, two outside speakers, and I was one of the outside speakers 20 years ago, 1992. I spoke about the future of personal computing. And I said uh, uh, mobile devices would be the future of personal computing. And in the future, people's primary personal computer would be something that's in their pocket, uh, would be very inexpensive, easy to use. Um, and that you know, laptops and desktops wouldn't go away, but that the momentum would shift to a mobile space. Uh, I then told uh, just a group at Intel that they'd have to do three, three things to be, uh, to be a relevant player in that. They had to get really serious about power consumption, which they weren't at the time. They had to get serious about cost reduction. Their CPUs cost about over $400, and these devices are going to cost like $500. And they had to think about packaging. Um, well, that talk was one of the worst received talks I ever gave. Uh, I don't think anyone believed me. And I don't blame them, I guess. Um, it was pretty cold in the room after that. I, um, you know, the, the, it was, it was a little bit hard to imagine we could build really powerful personal computers, but I don't think that was the big issue. The big issue is when people asked me what they were going to do with these personal computers, um, I didn't really have a good answer. If you think back in 1992, the primary uses of a personal computer were uh, word processing, spreadsheets, and databases. None of those were suitable for a very small device. Um, we had no, at that time, there were no public wireless data networks. There was no World Wide Web. There were no browsers. There was no digital cameras. There was no digital music. Memory on a handheld device would be measured in kilobytes, not gigabytes. And so it was kind of difficult to imagine what you would do with such a thing. When I asked, I said, you know, somehow you're going to access information on it. I'm not really certain. And that wasn't a very good answer. Uh, but I was very, very confident that this was going to happen. Uh, I knew that we'd be able to build powerful computers because people like you in the room were following Moore's law, if you will. And I just knew that people would want to use them and that this would enable a whole new uh, way of interacting with the digital world. And uh, so I dedicated myself to doing that for a number of years. Today's talk is, is on a totally different topic. Uh, I'm going to talk about a different future. I'm going to talk about the future um, of computing in general, specifically computer architecture. Um, and this is coming out of work which precedes my work in mobile devices. I fell in love with brains over 30 years ago, right out of college. And um, I said, my gosh, the brains are so cool, I want to study them, just like you heard uh, um, a moment ago, other people do the same thing. And so I set myself two goals um, what, 30 years ago. And these are the two goals I set. I said, first of all, we should be able to discover the operating principles of the neocortex. Now, if, just make sure you all know, the neocortex is about half your brain. It's the big wrinkly thing on top. And that's where almost all high-level intelligence, vision, language, perception, and, and planning occurs. And I think we should be able to figure this how this thing works. It's not magic. It's just a bunch of cells, and they seem to be pretty robust. Um, and then once we figure out those principles, we should be able to build machines that work on those principles. And that was going to be fantastic. These machines would be able to do amazing things. I was just certain of this. And so I set about doing this. My whole, my whole life in mobile computing was a sidetrack for 15 years. I got, I got pulled off of it. But um, fortunately, for the, over the last 10 years, I've been able to work full time on this. First at the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, which was an institute I, I founded 10 years ago, which is now at Berkeley. And then more recently at my, my newest company, Numenta. Um, as you heard, I wrote a book about this stuff seven years ago. We had some really great, amazing breakthroughs about two and a half years ago. And I'm going to tell you about those today. So we've made a lot of progress on this, and uh, both on the first topic of discovering operating principles of the neocortex, and we're starting to build machines that work on those principles, and they're pretty cool, too. And I'm going to tell you about them. Uh, here's the agenda for my talk. Um, I'm going to first talk, talk about the brain as a, as a predictive modeling system, a very high-level introduction to the brain. And in this talk, by the way, I use the word brain and neocortex interchangeably. I'm always talking about the neocortex, so excuse me for that. I'm going to talk about three interesting uh, properties about the neocortex, some of its principles. One is it works on sparse distributed representations. I'm going to talk about the, the, the properties of those. I'm going to talk about sequence memory, which is the primary memory operation in the brain. And then I'm going to talk about online learning, which is uh, sort of the memory formation. Then I'm going to show you a product called Grok, which is just to illustrate that this stuff actually works and what it looks like when it's working. And then I'm going to talk briefly about the future and where this might all be going. 
Um, so in this talk, I usually live in the world of neuroscience. And you guys are not neuroscientists, you're computer scientists. And, um, and so I'm trying something a little different in this talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start switching my language around a bit to talk a little bit more like the brain as, a, as in the language of a computer scientist. And I'll be bouncing back and forth. So I hope I don't get you confused by that a little bit. All right, let's just dive right into it. Here's the simplest explanation I can give you for what a brain does, a neocortex does. You have a set of sensors. And I apologize if you're listening to it, I can't read this. Um, you have a set of sensors on the left here. We have your, your, your eyes, your ears, and your skin, if you will. These are actually arrays of sensors. There are a million sensors in your eye. It's not one sense. There's a million sensors on your skin, and there's about 30,000 in your cochlea. Um, these create a stream of data going into your brain. It's a high-velocity stream. It's changing on the order of milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, or hundreds of milliseconds. That's high for biology. That's low for you guys. Um, and it's streaming into the brain, and the brain is a memory system. And when you're born, your neocortex has structure, but it doesn't know anything. It doesn't know about ISCA, it doesn't know about conferences, it doesn't know about computers and cameras and so on. It has to learn that stuff. It has to build a model of the world. It has to learn everything you know, practically, uh, from that data stream. And what, you can, what the model, it builds a model of the world, and what the model does is the three basic operations are the model makes predictions about what's going to happen next. You're not conscious of most of these predictions. Um, Mostly, these are things your, your brain is continually predicting what you're going to hear, what you're going to see and feel. It, it can, from those, it can detect anomalies, um, so something that happened that didn't expect to happen. And finally, it takes actions. Um, it, can, it generates behavior. These are the three things that the brain does based on its model. If I now were to break it down and tell you what are the three biggest operating principles that I could think of to understand how the neocortex works, the first is hierarchy. The neocortex is literally, physically structured as a hierarchy. It's, it looks like a sheet of cells, but the wiring is a hierarchical wiring. So I have a little sort of caricature drawing of it here. Um, information from the senses flows into the hierarchy. It goes up and both back down the hierarchy. And the hierarchy is a, is a, a set of memory regions that are connected together hierarchically. So it's all memory. It's a type of memory. It turns out that those memory regions, shown here in those little horizontal bar bars, are Actually, um, they're all doing the same thing. This is a hard to believe but true fact. They're all doing the same memory operation, and what makes one part vision, another part hearing, is what they're connected to and what data they're seeing. The second major um, uh, tri uh, attribute of a neocortex is what each of these regions is doing. And what they're doing, the primary thing, the most memory is allocated to sequence memory. Now, you might be surprised by this, maybe not, but think about what you're doing right now. You have this high-velocity data stream coming into your brain that I've created through various means. And uh, you're trying to understand it. And your brain is understanding it, hopefully. And what it's doing is, that in order to do that, it has to, it, this is a stream of data. And the order in which it occurs and the timing is very, very important. So to recognize my words and my phrases, you actually have to have memory of what those things sound like in time, in space. It's sequence memory. Similarly, in the neocortex, all the regions are generating behavior. Every region is, actually. And that is also a complex sequence. What I'm doing right now, speaking to you, I'm playing back recorded, if you will, not recorded, but, but memorized patterns, very complex, high-velocity data streams controlling my muscles right now on the order of milliseconds and tens of milliseconds. And so I'm playing back memory. And so the vast majority of what the neocortex does, not everything, but the vast majority is sequence memory. You need that for inference, you need it for prediction, and you need it for behavior. And the third component here the third high, top level thing is the type of data that the brain uses. The brain uses what we call sparse distributed representations. Literally, we're talking about, if you look at the cells in the brain, very, you know, what, what kind of patterns of activity do you see on them? And they're sparse, meaning not many of the cells are active at any point in time. So we call this sparse distributed representations. It's a sparse distributed representation as soon as it leaves the sense. So right on your optic nerve, it's already sparse. And, and everywhere in between the regions is sparse. And what's actually stored are sparse distributed representations. In this talk, I'm only going to talk about two of these. I'm going to talk about, not hierarchy, I'm going to talk about the sequence memory and sparse distributed representations. Uh, in some sense, I'll be describing how one small region of a neocortex works. Not the whole hierarchy, just one small region. That's all we have time for today. And so we're going to go through that. And I'm going to start with sparse distributed representations. So while I'm going to talk about sparse distributed representations as if like they're ones and zeros, in the back of your mind, you can think about these are cells that are coming on and off. OK, let me tell you a little story about representation. A number of years ago, 
um, uh, an AI researcher, an artificial intelligence researcher, who had just retired from a lifetime doing AI research, he was chatting with me, and he told me, he said, you know what, the, you know, one of the biggest problems in AI, and he says, no, he says, the only problem in AI is the problem of representation. And I didn't know what he meant by that. Um, I kind of had a sense, but I didn't really understand. I now understand what he meant by that. The problem of representation is one of how do I know the things in the world and how they relate to each other? And when you try to do that in computer structures, you end up with all complicated ways of doing various types of data structures, and it doesn't work right. It's just too hard. Somehow the brain keeps track of all the things in the world and how they relate to each other in some holistic way. And that's what he was referring to. And sparse distributed representations is a solution to this. So what, what is a sparse distributed representation? First of all, it's just, it's a, it's a representation that has a lot of bits. So instead of 8 bits or 20 bits or 32 bits, it's thousands of bits. So we want to represent something, in an S, I call this an SDR, sparse distributed representation. So we have thousands of bits. And it's sparse because at any point in time, very few of them are active. Very few of them are ones. So you have mostly zeros and a few ones. In our work in the Menta, we typically use, and I'm going to use this for this talk, we use representations that are 2,000 bits long, of which 40 or 2% are active. So if I want to represent something, I have 40 ones and 1,960 zeros. Okay? Now, what's really unique about this is that each bit has semantic meaning. If I look at a cell in the brain, I can point to that and say, what does that cell respond to? It's not arbitrary. It's learned, but it's not arbitrary. And so each bit has semantic meaning. If I want to form a representation of something using a sparse distributed representation, how would I do that? Let's say I want to form a representation of a letter instead of ASCII. I would, I would have bits that represent, is this a vowel or a consonant? I have bits that say, what does it sound like? Is it an E sound or an O sound? Does it have a hard sound? Does it have a fricative sound? How is it drawn? I could have bits that represent, is it closed shape or open shape? Does it have descenders and ascenders? And what I do is I pick the top 40 representations, the top 2% to represent this object. Okay? So the, the, the encoding of the object itself tells me what its primary attributes are. You can contrast this to what we might call dense representations, which we typically use in computers. A dense reputation is a few bits, 8 to maybe 128. I don't know what you guys are up to these days. Um, and we use typically use all combinations of ones and zeros. And an example would be an ASCII code. And we can say, what does the third bit in an ASCII code mean? Well, it means nothing. It has no inherent meaning. You have to look at all the bits to figure out what it is. That's not the way it works in brains. And that's not the way it is in sparse distributed representations. So let's now talk about some of the properties of sparse distributed representations. These are really important to understand what else is going to talk about today. So see, here's some properties. The number one property is I can compare two sparse distributed representations. This is pretty simple. And um, I'm apologizing because my slide, for those of you who can see my slides, there's some misalignment here on the, some of these slides coming up. Um, I'm supposed to be highlighting all the ones. If it doesn't look like that, don't get confused. Anyway, so I can compare two sparse distributed representations. And if I see that they have a one in the same location, that means they're sharing a semantic meaning. They're sharing some information. This is not random. And so if I see if I've took two of these representations and they have 10 bits in common, that's highly significant. That means they share a great deal of semantic common meaning. Uh, and so I can do the semantic comparison. Now let's say I, I say, what if I wanted to store one of these? What if I had one and I said, OK, remember this, and now tell me if it occurs again. How would I do that? Well, you might say, well, just store all 2,000 bits. But that's, you don't need to do that. What we, we can do the following. You say, look, we just store an index into the one bits. So if I got 40 in, 40 ones, I have 40 index uh, entries. And I say, oh, if I see those ones in those locations, I know I have my character. Because I know I have my, my, my representation, because all the other ones are going to be 0. Now, this is true, but we're going to do something else. What if I told you that you can't store all 40, but you can only randomly pick 10 of them? So you got 41 bits. I can't store the locations all. I can only store indexes to 10 randomly chosen. Uh, what would happen if I did that? Um, you might say, well, I could have errors, because I could see those 10 bits, but the other 30 could be wrong. Well, if you do the math on this, it turns out that's very unlikely to happen. This is some interesting properties of sparse representations. It's extremely unlikely. In fact, if you find 10 bits that are correct, you're almost guaranteed to have the rest of them correct, um, because of the nature of sparse, uh, these, these sparse patterns. But even if you made a mistake, even if you found 10 bits that are correct and the others are different, you would have found something that's semantically very similar to the thing you thought you stored. 
And so if you make an error by subsampling, it's what we call this, subsampling, if you make an error, it's an error that's not a bad error. It's a semantically similar error, and that's generally OK. So the brain takes advantage of this when it's making connections. It doesn't need to connect everywhere. You just need to find some connections uh, to a subset of what you're looking for. So that's how we store information. Now we're going to throw one more property, which is very important. What if I took 10 of these sparse distributed representations and I ordered them together? I formed a union of them. And so I started off 10 things that had 2% of the bits active, and now I have one thing, 2,000 bits, which has about roughly 20% of the bits active. That's a one-way street. I can't undo that. I can't say, hey, what were those 10? But what I can do is the following. I can say, here's an unknown. I have a new unknown sparse distributed representation, and I want to know if it's in, contained in that original 10. And I can do that. All I have to do is find the ones in my new unknown and see if, they, if there's an equivalent bit on in the union. And I'll say, if, if it is, I'll say this is a member. Now, you might, if you're following this, you might say, hey, that, that, that could be an error. I could be picking one from one of those representations and another one from another one of those representations and another one from another one of those representations. So I could be making a mistake. It's true. However, again, simple math shows you it's almost impossible to happen. It's a, almost an astronomically unlikely event that you would get that wrong. And so you can be very confident that if you try to match an unknown to a union, you can figure out that um, it's in that. It's in that original set. Now, how are we going to use this? We're going to use this in the following way. When the brain makes a prediction, it makes a prediction of multiple things occurring at once. It's not just a single prediction. When you're predicting what word I'm going to say, it's not exactly what word I'm going to say, but you'll know if I say something wrong. So you're predicting a sense of attributes of the things I might say. It's a, it's a union of all the things you might be, I might say. And you'll be able to tell if what I do say is part of that or not. This is the general nature of predictions. There are multiple predictions going on simultaneously, and we need to know if the new thing that occurs is, is a subset of that or part of that. So that's a property we're going to use. So these are the property of sparse distributed representations. And they're really cool. There's some other ones, too. Before I go on, if you're going to remember one thing from my talk today, just one, and you can then zone out and tune into the Apple Developer Conference or something, um, you, you can uh, just remember this, that sparse distributed representations are the key element about machine intelligence. All future machine intelligence are going to be built on sparse distributed representations. This is the number one thing that's important, because it solves the representation problem in some very, very elegant ways, more so than I have time to talk about now. OK, we now want to do the following. We want to learn how sequences of these are memorized. How do I take streams of these things that are flying in at high velocity and memorize the temporal patterns in them? So that's our next question, is sequence memory? Uh, we're going to go back to the brain here a little bit and look at it. So here's a picture of the brain. We've got a little, a little box representing us. I'm just going to zoom in on one little section of the neocortex. If you look at the little section of the neocortex, it's just a couple millimeters thick. And it has these layers of cells in there. They're densely packed in there. There's cells uh, in these layers, in these columns. If I zoom in on one, of the, one small section there, there's a little character drawing I've drawn. This shows, if you see here, all those little circles are like cells. Those are like neurons. And, and we have two basic operating or organizing principles in a uh, neocortical slice. First, shown by the green arrow, is that the cells that are vertically aligned have similar response properties. They're in a column. So when I have a feed-forward pattern to the system, those cells all seem to respond to the same input pattern. However, the vast majority of connections are shown by the orange arrow. Those are to the, to the side. They go to other columns. It's between the columns. So we have the vast majority of memory. And I'm going to show you that that's really sequence memory. Um, so we have that. Now if we zoom in on one of these cells, uh, just one of those little circles, this is a picture of a classic uh, uh, cortical neuron, a pyramidal cell. You see it has all these branches on it. Those are called the dendrites. And those are all the connections, the input connections to the cell occur. Um, and there's typically thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of connections on each neuron. If we now zoom in on one of those dendrites, uh, zoom in a small section of the dendrites, my last picture here, um, here you see, on this, you can actually see the connections, if you're close enough to the picture. Uh, on, there's a little spines on that, and those are actual synapses on that little dendritic tree there. They're packed in there about one micron apart. Uh, so you can get you know, uh, a little segment, maybe 40 microns wrong. You can get 40 of them in there. And um, uh, those connections, we now know, we've learned a, a, some really interesting things about them in the last 15 years. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that there's a very nonlinear property going on here. 
when these synapses become active, like a spike comes from another neuron, if they occur within a certain period of time, within a few milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, and they're in a short distance from each other, typically 40 microns, that they have a nonlinear, uh, superlinear event. They, they generate a spike on the neuron dendrite itself. That is, they will, they will all of a sudden say, wow, there's 10 of these things active at the same time, close together. Let's tell the cell body about this and send a spike to the cell body. And if, they, if it's below that, then nothing happens. So it's like, a, it's like a threshold coincidence detector. We, we're detecting a coactive activity on a dendritic spike. So we're going we're gonna to model this. Um, this is a picture of the way we model this at Nomentum. Uh, we're going to model a small section of a, of a slice of a neocortex, shown in the, in the bottom center there. You can see there, there's, that's composed of all these little cubes. Those are representing our artificial neurons, if you will. Um, the colors represent their activations. I'll get to that in a moment. And you can see we, this particular picture shows an array of these cells in a stack four high, a column of four deep. Each of our neurons at, that we model is a, much more sophisticated than you've ever seen in, a, in an artificial neural network. Um, we, I'm just going to talk about the blue dots on that, on that neuron model. Those blue dots represent the, the synapses that I was just talking about. Those are the connections to other cells that are arranged on a dendritic segment. So I show, I show in that picture five dendritic segments. There's actually many more. But those are like coincidence detectors. And so if we see an activity on one of those coincidence detectors of a certain number, we're going to, do or the, we're going to generate a, a one, we're going to order it together, and that cell will become active. So the question we want to answer now is, how does this structure in those neurons gen learn sequences? And we figured this out. I'm pretty, very, very confident in the basic approach I'm about to tell you here. Because um, that's the key of it all, is sequence memory. So let's, let's start with a picture here. Let's take our sparse distributed representation, our ones and our zeros, and lay them out in a two-dimensional array like this. This is only a small section of one. This is not 2,000 bits. This is about a quarter of that, so I'm just for illustration purposes. The one bits are represented by those, those cubes that are active, the cells that are active. Those are our ones, and all the others are zeros. So here we have a sparse distributed representation. In the brain, it matters that it's a two-dimensional sheet, but from the point of view you're thinking about it today, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's just an artifact. Now, at any particular time, I have a pattern there. So here's a time one, and here's a time two. Imagine this is going on very rapidly. As I'm speaking right now, in your head, your cells are doing this, going bing, 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 just like that. Um, and we want to learn this sequence. We want to learn sequences of these things. How do you do that? Well, what we're going to do is when one of these cells becomes active, it gets active from a feed-forward input, it's going to look at all the cells that were active previously, just a moment ago. And he says, look, if I, can, if I can remember the cells that are active a moment ago, I can now predict my own activity. Every cell is doing this. And the cells are going to become active about 2% of the time, on average. So every once in a while, every cell is going to become active at some point in time. And they say, OK, I'm going to try to remember who was just active prior to me. And if I see that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to become, uh, predict my own activity. So here's a cell learning to predict its own activity. It says, well, I became active. Here are four cells that were nearby. That, um, that were active just prior to me. And this can be done. You can subsample. You don't need to look at all of them. You just need to look at some of them and, and form connections to them. Now, if every cell does this, every cell, then at any moment in time, every cell is trying to predict, hey, if, if, am I going to happen next? Am I going to come happen next? Here's what it looks like. Uh, I'll just, I'm just reminding you here in this bottom right-hand corner that th those connections up there are actually the connections on one of the dendrites of that cell. Um, here's what it might look like. Here's an input where the red cells are being the feed-forward input. This is the thing that's occurring in the world right now, and the yellow cells are a prediction. Now, there's more yellow cells in this particular case because there's more than one prediction. Imagine I learned the transitions from A to B, and then from A to C, and from A to D. And I show you A. Well, I'm going to predict B, C, and D simultaneously, and that's what's happening right here. Um, now, this is the beginning of our sequence memory. It is a, we've learned a transition from one state to the next state, or to ne one of several next states. Um, but in this scenario, the way I've described it here, it's what we'd call a first-order memory. There's, there's no ability to look further back in time than just the previous step. All I can do is predict what's going to happen next based on what's happening right now. And there's no history, other than what I've memorized, but there's no history. But that's not the way the world works. We actually need a very high-order memory. We need a memory that can go back many steps. It's like saying, if I'm going to predict the next note in the melody, I might need to go back four or five notes before I know what the next note is. It's the difference between four, two sequences, A, B, C, D, and X, B, C, Y. 
If I see B and C, that's not enough to know whether we're going to get a, a, an E or a Y, or a D or Y. I have to go back three or four steps to figure out what the right prediction is. So we need a high order sequence memory, and, and this one doesn't cut it. The way we're going to solve that is we're going to use columns of cells. We're going to, we're, and it's just, just showing stacking it up here. And let me illustrate that on this next slide. This slide shows the same sparse distributed representation two times. So you see the ones and zeros there? Those are the same representation. Now we're going to represent each bit not with one thing, but with 10 things. So each bit it's in, in our brain is a column of cells. We're going to represent by 10 cells in this drawing. And when a, when a bit is one, when a column is active, we are going to pick one of those 10. OK? So, we got, so you can see, maybe you can see that I, I filled in the little circles there above each of these. Now we can randomly pick this to begin with, but we're going to learn that they're going to be memorized. So, but we can pick it randomly. Now I've shown two representations here, and I've just picked, randomly picked different ones in those columns. Pick one of the 10 in each of the columns. Some of the columns might have the same, uh, same cell. It doesn't really matter. Now you think about it this way. Here we have 40 bits that are on. 40 columns are active. There's 10 cells in each one, so there's 10 ways of representing each bit. So there are actually, um, there are um, 10 to the 40th ways of representing the same input. 10 to the 40th. Very, very big numbers we're talking about here. Basically, I have an unlimited capacity to represent the same input pattern in different contexts. This, give me an example of what this is. I'm going to say the sound two, the sound two. And I'm going to use it in a sentence. There are too many two twos to count. Right? I use the sound two in, in several different contexts. There are four different contexts. Your brain doesn't get confused by them. It doesn't hear them as the same way. How come? It's the same pattern coming in, but it's actually representing them differently. What it's doing is it's picking different cells in those columns to represent the sound in different contexts. And when you do this, and I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing, um, but if you use the same principle I showed you before, where you were each cell now in those columns is learning to form connections to other cells in the columns, you end up creating a very interesting sequence memory. Um, and first of all, it's high capacity. In the system I've been talking about with 2,000 columns, and we basically can order, remember millions of transitions. And, so, and then it's variable order. I can remember first order, second order, third order. It, it basically learns, if the patterns repeat, it can learn very long, complex sequences. It can make multiple predictions at the same time. So at any point in time, given the context, given what it's learned, given what the current is happening, it can make what is going to happen next. And, um, and it also exhibits a form of semantic generalization. I've learned a sequence based on a set of sparse distributed representations. However, if I give you a new set of sparse distributed representations that are different, but are semantically similar, they overlap with the previous ones, the memory will apply the sequence memory from the earlier learning to the new sparse distributed representations. Um, these are all very desirable properties we need in intelligent systems in, uh, to do these things. OK, uh, you'll have to trust me. I'll show this working to you in a moment here. Uh, I now want to switch gears to the actual memory operation itself. How do we actually store something? And there's, some really, and there's a really important attribute we have to solve here. It has to be an online learning system. Again, online means the following. It means that there's no time to look at the statistics of the data. You just have to take the data as it goes, and you learn it on the fly. And so if a new pattern comes in you haven't seen before, you don't know yet whether it's noise or if it's the beginning of something important. You have to start learning it. It's a pretty simple way to do this. You have to train on every record or every moment in time. If the pattern does not repeat, you forget it. And if it does repeat, you reinforce it. OK, let me tell you how this, we think this is done in brains. I'm pretty certain. Well, I know this is how it's done in brains. Um, let's go back to a little picture here. We're, we're talking about these cells in these layers are forming connections. Those connections are on, on a dendrite. And there's a picture of that dendrite again from one of those, uh, those neurons on the right. Now, let me tell you something else we've learned about synapses in the last 15 years. We used to think that memory was in the formation of the strength of the synapse. That is, how, what its weight is. It's like, like a scalar value. And that, and that you increase the weight or decrease the weight. Well, people still think this, but it's not true. Uh, it's, it's, it's not true for a couple reasons. First of all, um, synapses are very stochastic. They don't work a lot of the time. They're really, really buggy things. And if you have anything which requires any kind of precision on it, forget it. It's just not going to happen. But what we've learned is that synapses can form very rapidly from nothing, not existing, to existing. That can happen in under a minute. You can literally, you can watch a movie of these things growing. 
it doesn't have to go very far. So you have an axon and a dendrite near each other. A new synapse can go whoop and, and grow, and it can be forgotten very quickly as well. So what we really want to do is we don't want to store synapses as a scalar. We want to store them as a binary. It's either it's connector or it's not connector. Here's how we do this. We, we have two things. We, we have a thing called the, uh, a, a permanence, which is a scalar, which represents how much of this has grown. Has it started growing? And if it's connected, how, how, how permanent is it? That's a scalar. But it's, it's a binary connection. It's either connected or not connected. So if our, if our scalar, our permanence, gets above some threshold, such as 0.2, then we'll say it's connected at a strength of 1. And this is a great way of doing this, because this gives us our online learning capability. The more I learn something over and over again, the permanence can go all the way up to 1, and it takes a long time to forget it. And however, if, you know, so it's, we're constantly forgetting and constantly learning, but then the connections become binary. All right, so there you go. Those are our three properties I wanted to talk about today. Um, and now uh, you might ask, you might, guys, you all computer people, memory people, you might say, hey, what is, add this up for me. What, is, what are the kind of requirements we're talking about here? So here's my, I made this slide, minimum requirements, uh, requirements for a minimum viable implementation. So I'm using um, our, the one we're using at Nementib commonly today, which is these 2,000 columns. Now, remember, I'm not talking about regions in a hierarchy, so we're just looking at one small section of a, of a, of a region. We have 2,000 columns. We typically use 30 cells per column. So we have 2,000 bits, each represented by 30, 30 cells. Our, our cells typically have a limit of 128 segments per, per de, um, dendritic segments per, per cell. And we typically have about 40 connections per uh, dendritic segment. Those are all biologically realistic numbers. Those are right in the ballpark of what we, we find in, in the brain. And so again, we're mining what we're talking about there. One section of a blow it up of those cells that look like that. If you add all that up, it's about 300 million connections. Um, each one of those, you have to have an index and in uh, where it's connected to and a permanence. And, um, and this, we can build this where the memory capacity is fixed or dynamic. We tend to use fixed these days, meaning we don't, we don't allocate more memory, memory. We just learn and forget. Uh, and that seems to work very well. But it could be made dynamic if we wanted to. Now, interesting point here, there is no single point of failure in this system. In fact, there's not even a close to single point of failure. You can drop out columns, it works just fine. You can drop out cells, it works just fine. You can drop out dendrites, it works fine. You can drop out uh, synapses, it works just fine. This is a very robust system. It, it, is, it, it degrades gracefully all the way down, and there's not a single point of failure here. You might think, how, what percentage of the actual neocortex this is? I did this in my sleep last night. I did the number, I hope I got it right. I think it's about one one-hundred-thousandth of what a, a human neocortex is. So we're talking about one one-hundred-thousandth of what, what's going on in your brain for something like this. And this is very useful. You'll see in a moment, we can do a lot with this. However, one one-hundred-thousandth isn't that much. Because in this industry, just a few years from now, we'll be there. So uh, that's, that's encouraging for me. OK, let's go on to the, our, our next thing. What can you do with this? Does it work? Am I making this all up? Um, yeah, it works, and uh, we can do some really interesting things with it. So I'm now going to just illustrate how we've done this in a product. I have to give you a little bit of background for the product. You, you won't understand what I'm talking about unless I give you some background. So um, the background is in the field of predictive analytics, so data mining, if you will. Today, people collect lots of data from sensors in the world. They put it in big databases, and they try to get information or use utility out of them. Uh, and they use two ways of doing that. They use visualization tools to look at graphs and charts. And they have uh, predictive modeling tools, so they build uh, models of the data to try to make predictions from it. There's some real problems in the industry today. Uh, the challenges they face, that the data is often very messy. The models become obsolete. Very often, the patterns in the data change rapidly on a daily basis or a weekly basis. So the models become old. It's difficult to do this. requires a lot of skills. And they look at, they're looking at huge amounts of data. They're storing this data, and they don't even know what to do with it. They've got petabytes of data sitting around trying to figure out what to do with it. This is all going to change. Um, we're going to go to a world where it's, it, we're taking data directly from the sensors and streaming them into online models, just like the brain. We're going to stream these in online models. Um, there's going to be no storage of the data. So you're basically taking sensors from buildings and cars and roads and so on, streaming it right through these models. And from them, we're going to make predictions, detect anomalies, and take action on them. So we're modeling what the brain does here. And this is a big opportunity. Um, the challenges we face are that there are literally going to be trillions of data sources in the world. This is, I'm not making this up. Lots of people believe this. Trillions of data sources in the world, hundreds of billions of models to them. So the challenge here is how do we do this rapidly and replicate this in, without using humans? Um, and that's what our product uh, does. Uh, so the question here, remember, to do this, we still have to have online learning, and we have to have our variable order sequence memory. These are our characteristics we need. 
So I'm just going to show you um, um, a, a product called Grok, which is a cloud-based prediction engine for streaming data. It doesn't have to be based in the cloud. That's what it is today. Here's a picture of what, you, what it looks like uh, architecturally. On the left, you see a, a series of records coming in. These are uh, records from, uh, from sensors and data. It can be multivariate records, one or more fields. They can be the numbers and categories, dates and times, and other things. We run them through a set of encoders, which are just like your senses. And these are standard encoders. You don't have to custom create these. And they turn those patterns, those numbers, into sparse distributed representation. So we'll take a number and turn it into a sparse distributed representation. I won't have time to show you how we do that today. Then we take those sparse distributed representations and run them through a sequence memory, just like I was talking about, literally a modeling of a section of the neocortex, 2,000 columns, 60,000 60, cells. And then we get predictions and anomalies out the other side. Uh, the user of the system has to define a problem, like what am I trying to predict? What is my data? How often do I want to predict? I might want to predict once an hour. They may get their data every five minutes, but they're trying to predict something three or four or six hours in advance. So they define the problem. They provide the data. Grok basically determines how to build the best model it can, which fields to use, what encoders to use, uh, if it has to do any aggregation. And what it outputs is a prediction, a multiple predictions, one or more predictions with probabilities. And literally, we're going to be reading those cells I just talked about earlier. It has to learn continuously so it's online. We've had a lot of interest in different fields here. Uh, energy pricing, energy demand, product forecasting, ad networks, machines efficiencies, people trying to allocate uh, machines various ways. A lot of interest in anomaly detection in, high, um, in factory equipment and, and, high, and very expensive equipment. Um, so we have a lot of, lot of interest uh, in this product. We're trying to figure out what best ways to bring it to market. Let me show you how it works. So let me just show you what the output might look like. Here it is. I'm, I'm trying to predict. There's two lines. There's a blue line and a red line, if you can't see them, um, which is the energy consumption in a, 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 a geographic region in New York. And um, you can see there's a daily pattern there. Uh, Grok's prediction is, I believe, the blue line. Grok's prediction is the blue line. And uh, it's doing pretty well. You'll see in the middle that these are daily patterns. The two in the middle are different are Saturday and Sunday. We don't tell it the system this. It just learns these things on its own. And it's doing a very good job here. Um, we can do this at the region level, the building level, the room level, the refrigerator level, you name it. We can do this. In this case, we're sampling every 15 minutes as we get a new data point every 15 minutes. And Grok has been asked to predict four hours into the future. Um, and it's, it's very good at that. Here's another example of sort of server load. This is a company that's trying to, um, they, they do transcoding of video. And so people send up a video to them. They want instantly to have it transcoded in multiple formats and made it streaming available immediately. So they have to keep a bunch of servers online ready, and those servers are expensive. So they want to do a better prediction of how many servers they need at any point in time. So it's a video hosting service. Um, in this case, uh, it's, it's the same thing, the blue and the red, it's Grok and the actual, and you know, we're doing very well relative to the best that they could have done before. I want, I want to switch modes here and show you the internals of this, what's going on. So this is what's going on. You can ignore the data on the left here. Just look at the, the, the big uh, square on the right. Um, we're at some point in the data, and at this point in the data, we're looking now at the activations of the columns internal to Grok. So there's 2,000, this is an array of 2,000 bits, if you will. The green dots are 40. Those are the 40 bits that are both active and were predicted. The green means that we predicted this bit was going to become active, and it did become active. This is a perfect prediction, a single prediction. This occurs a lot, actually, saying I predicted one thing, and that's what happened. Here's another example, a different point in the data, where um, the blue circles are things that were predicted that didn't occur. But that's not an error, because the green things did occur. So it's essentially saying I predicted multiple things could occur at this point, and one of them did occur. That's a good match. Uh, one of the things that occurred actually happened. One of the things that I predicted actually happened. Here is the third picture, and I think you will not be able to see this. So trust me, I'll describe what's on here. There are some red circles on there. People up front can see that. Um, here we're seeing some red circles. The red circles are bits that were not predicted but did occur, something that occurred but weren't, was not anticipated. That's like an anomaly. We also have some the, the blue circles, which are essentially saying, hey, these are things I predicted that didn't occur. And we have some green ones that are saying, these are things I predicted that did occur. So we have, a, we have an unexpected event here, but it's a fine thing. It's not like it was right or wrong. It's a finessey thing. I can say, well, how much of it is right and how much of it wrong? What semantic components were right and wrong and so on? There's a lot of detail in here. And we can apply that to anomaly detection problems. This, uh, I won't go through the details of this, but this is oil temperature in a very expensive turbine, wind turbine, offshore wind turbine gearbox. 
And the blue line is showing how the temperature goes up and down very rapidly all day long. And we want to detect anomalies in that. And, and, and it's not just a simple matter of threshold. We don't want to say, oh, the oil's temperature is too hot or too cold. That's important. They can do that easily. What we want to see is that somehow the system doesn't look healthy. And so we can tell, it's like saying, I'm listening to a melody and the wrong note occurs. The, the note itself isn't wrong, but it's just the wrong sequence. And Grok can do that. And the bottom of this chart, the red line is the sort of what we call the anomaly score from Grok, which is really looking at the internals of how many things are predicted correctly and incorrectly. And it turns out, in this case, it did a very good job detecting things before they failed, saying this is unusual. Um, so where is all this going? Let me see, I'm doing our time here. OK, where is all this going? Uh, I'm going to speculate a bit now. And um, hopefully, um, uh, I won't get in over my head. Uh, let me just start by saying there's a lot more to do. Uh, we're not done with this. Uh, we're just getting started. And I don't want to pretend like, oh, this is so simple. It's not. It's a very complex system we're trying to do here. But we've made a lot of progress. But there's some things we have more to do. Uh, one of the biggest things we have to do is figure out how the whole sensory motor integration occurs. I mentioned earlier that every region of the neocortex is not only doing inference and prediction, it's also generating motor behavior. It's, it's something we didn't know 30 years ago, but we do know now. It seems like everything, the way we perceive the world, is how we interact with the world. We're not capturing that today, and it's a big issue. I've got a lot of really interesting clues as to how it works, and I think we can solve that in the next couple of years. Uh, we didn't talk about the hierarchy here. We started modeling hierarchies uh, at Numenta, and we were doing uh, various experiments with them, but they were too slow. Uh, we said, well, what can we do without a hierarchy? And that's when we ended up and started building Grok, because it took too much processing time and software to do this. Um, there's, when you have a hierarchy, you can add attention. And attention is a big issue for us as humans. We tend to not to all of our sensory input. We tend to various things at different points in time. So part of during my speech, you'll be listening carefully to what I'm saying. Other parts, you're reading the words, et cetera. Um, there's an issue, like, how are we going to deliver this? How is this going to manifest itself in the world uh, as we build systems like this? Well, today, I just showed you a cloud-based service uh, called Grok. That's, that's one way of doing it. There's clearly a desire to embed these things into products. You know, cars should have their own little predictive models, your cell phone. Every server, every machine, every tool, every room could be pre predicting its own activity and trying to figure out what's normal and so on. And so moving the, the move of this intelligence down towards the sensors makes sense. And so I can see that absolutely going to happen. At the same time, with a world full of trillions of sensors and hundreds of billions of models, we can connect them hierarchically so you can have an uber view of a, health of a whole economy or a whole building or a whole factory or a whole industry. And I don't know how this is going to play out. I, I really don't. But I'm, I, this is an interesting idea that, that these, um, you, you could sort of build this sort of uber hierarchies that span globally. Um, it's very interesting. And so I think it's going to go both ways. It's going to go down towards embedded and towards larger systems uh, that are hierarchically connected. The next question is, well, should we be building this in hardware, silicon, or whatever technique you're going to be using? And, and the answer is, of course we should, um, for, the, for the usual reasons, speed, cost, and power. Right? How is it going to play out? I don't know. That's your job. You guys can help me figure that out. But I think I, I tend to think about it in two different wells, two different categories. I tend to think of one as the memory itself. OK, we're forming memory. This is all about memory. We're talking about millions and billions and billions of bits being stored here. Well, that, that memory has got some interesting attributes to it. First of all, it's naturally fault tolerant. Well, how would you take advantage of that in designing you know, memory chips? Um, well, you could just say, hey, I can allow so many bits to be inactive. You might even have bus architectures in the chip that says, you know what, I can't service all the requests all the time. That's fine. I'll just throw some of them away um, because the system will keep working. I don't know. But the idea that we could redesign memory in the, th when the memory is designed about sparse distributed representations it gives you this opportunity to think what memory design is. And then a big part of this is the interconnect. We were talking about that at breakfast this morning. Uh, the majority of the volume in your brain is, is connection. It's the axons and dendrites. It's not the synapses and the cell bodies. The white matter is all just wiring. And so um, you know, this is a big issue. We have these very, very large uh, memory spaces that are sparsely connected and are hierarchically connected and, and sparsely connected on top of that. So how do we take advantage of that? Can we take advantage of the, I mean, how do we build that stuff? How do, we, how do we make systems that have this kind of architecture? Um, can we take advantage of the fact that we can subsample, that we can say, you know what, not all possible connections are, are possible. 
We're not going to allow you to do that. We'll just let some small percentage be, um, happen, and so on. So a lot of interesting ideas here. You know, we looked at some of the obvious ones, as well as working with some other people, like Dan Hammerstrom and some other people at MIT. You know, we looked at, like, could we accelerate this using GPUs or something like that? And we found that it really didn't help, because when you apply something like a GPU to this, it's really fast, but it can't take advantage of the sparsity. And it can't take it, and so it has to sort of run its whole course. Where in software, we can do all kinds of tricks uh, uh, because all this stuff is sparse, and so it really didn't help us. But I believe that there's going to be a major sil uh, silicon implementations and uh, implications of this. And finally, what are going to be the applications? What are we, this is, brings me back to the beginning of my talk, right, where I was at Intel 20 years ago saying I didn't know. Well, I'm going to give you sort of the same answer today. Uh, today, I've shown you a very first thing. This is like baby steps, you know, a prediction uh, anomaly detection system. I think it's really cool, and we're going to make a big business on it. But that's just the beginning. Where's it going to go? Well, a lot of people go to what I call the classics. The classics are, you know, hey, vision, language, speech, these are the classic AI problems. Uh, I'm not so optimistic about these. Uh, first, you know, we may not be able to solve them very soon. They, they, they have a lot of interesting complexities. They're very big systems and problems. Um, and often you, you need to be a human to really solve the language and speech problem. You might really need to be human, with human emotions and all those kind of things. Um, but also this, the history of technology suggests that this is not what's going to happen. The history of technology suggests that things that happen that are really exciting and super duper are things we didn't anticipate. We tend to think about the old stuff, but something new comes along. It's like the same thing with this, you know, the mobile phone, the mobile, the mobile computer. We couldn't anticipate what the exciting applications were going to be, but now they're here, they're exciting. And the same thing is going to happen here. So what are going to be the big wins? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. And I hope you don't give me a cold reception like I got 20 years ago, because I can't answer that question. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be fantastic. We can build machines not like humans. When, the goal of this is not to build human-like robots or anything like that. It's machines that work on the principles of the brain. And those machines can be faster than brains. They can be bigger than brains. We can send them into outer space. This is how we're going to explore the universe. This is how we're going to use them for science and, and, and mathematics. I'm very, very excited about what might occur. And I hope those things do occur. But actually, how it plays out, we will just have to wait and see. OK, if I've interest you, these are three things you can do. You can read my book on intelligence, which talks about the sort of the overall philosophy. You, you heard about that earlier. There's a white paper on our website which goes into detail about these learning algorithms, much more detail than I talked about today. And, um, and there's some pseudocode there. You can actually code these things up. We have a bunch of people who have done that around the world so far. Um, we haven't put all of the details up there. Our, our the details in terms of our product are not up there. But the learning algorithms are up there in detail. And then you can talk to me. I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. Uh, that's my email address. You can write to me. And now I am done. Thank you very much.